so you may have detected a common theme. I'm interested in robots. <laughs> and I hope that you also are, because I really do believe that robotics is the technology of the 21st century. I love this quote from Nikola Tesla, because of course he was building regular controlled robots in 1898 with his cell in New York. And he continued to experiment with that technology amongst everything else that he did. And as far as he was concerned, when he, um, when he said that in the 21st century, the robot will take the place which slave labor occupied in ancient civilizations. Firstly, he believed that that would free mankind to pursue higher aspirations. But secondly, he believed that the technology was already a done deal. He did say, this is simple, I have already done it. We just haven't done enough yet. But there is absolutely no reason why within 100 years we will not have robots everywhere. It's taken us a little while to get there. But I think the fact that he saw the technology as freeing us to pursue our higher aspirations is one of the dominant themes in robotics. He changed his mind, and this is the other dominant theme in robotics. They're going to kill us all. Okay? So in his later life, Tesla claimed to develop a weapon that was more powerful than anything ever known, a charged particle beam that was so powerful that he decided not to tell anyone how it would work. And robotics is caught in between these two tensions. We often think only about bad robots, and we all know what they look like. <laughs> okay? What I want us to start thinking about, now I'm not saying that there are not bad robots out there, because anything that is designed solely for the purpose of inflicting harm, of killing, that is by definition bad, and yet we do it. We do it with justifications that while they may be capable of killing, they're actually saving many other lives. So the US government invests in robotic warfare because it saves US lives. Okay? This is a big ethical issue, but all too often, that's the only discussion we have about robots and ethics. And it's about those really bad robots. And what I want to talk about is designing not bad robots, but ordinary robots, and elevating ordinary robots into good robots, <laughs> okay? Because that's different. A good robot is something that we're going to need because we're going to see a heck of a lot of ordinary robots in our future. We're transitioning right now from the time when robotics was purely industrial. So the last 15 years, pretty much from late 50s through to early 2000s, robots were confined to the factories, in cages, kept away from people. That's changing. We have robots in our lives today, even if we don't always recognize them. And we will, we're about to have a lot more. And this is where it gets rather interesting. We need to make sure that we're designing good robots. And that's why I am so heavily involved in robotics research networks and in Silicon Valley robotics and robotics startups, because I want to see what the conditions are effectively at the birth of this robotic universe and start to try and predict or, or even perhaps shape in a little way things towards the optimal directions. Op optimal. And just on there, I would say Silicon Valley Robotics is what I call my day job, and the rest are just hobbies, but that's a coalition of robotics companies and startups, industry group, a not-for-profit industry group. And originally our goal was, our mission statement was to support innovation and commercialization. So we are explicitly about that gap between research and the real world. And that means that startups are of great interest. 
but it also means that I find it um, crossing the silos between robotics and all the rest of the world is also such an essential part of birthing the new robotics industry, which is going to be moving into the fields of service and consumer robots. And I will just leap straight into good robot design guidelines, and I will follow up by talking more about service and consumer robotics industry. So this is a, a, my version of a number of um, published suggestions, and I'll condense this a little bit and put a bit of a spin on it, but I think this is the heart of the rest of the talk. If you look at this, it looks at robots in a very pragmatic fashion, and it gives us some very specific suggestions as to what building a good robot would be. And I, don't, I think that outside of the field of design, this is probably not the way you would ever look at a robot. They are products, and yet we like to see them as all sorts of other things. And yet they are products that we have never had before, and predicting their impact is... It's like predicting what the internet was going to be like, right? It was going to democratize information and allow everybody to be anonymous and equal. We got eBay, we got email, and we got trolling. So our predictions and our reality don't come together terribly well, and this is why I'm very interested in robotics right now. I want to avoid robots small. This is a concept from uh, Ilya Nuba, professor at Carnegie Mellon, and I think it is, um, it is exactly what we're going, it's the exact metaphor for what will happen when we have a lot of robots in the world. They will be capable of polluting our environment physically in a way that we just haven't designed for yet. And yet, I, my children range from uh, teens to twenties. So I thought I knew what toy aisles looked like. Has anybody been into a large toy store in the last <coughs> ten years? Okay. Was it scary? Okay. The last time I went in there, things moved and talked and waved to get my attention and then triggered as I walked through the aisles. This was a really active and targeted place all of a sudden. This is a very different environment. Now, toy stores are probably one of the earliest consumer robotics areas. Very, very unsophisticated. But I think this gives you a taste for what robot small could be like. And let's just turn that into what really is robotics today? Because we tend to think of robotics in terms of humanoids, and they are the smallest proportion of robots in the world today by a huge margin. Industrial robots is the largest economic sector for robotics. It's around about 30 billion a year, but that's sort of two to three billion dollars worth of robots and 27 to 30 billion worth of services around those robots. And what that actually translates to is that there are approximately one and a half million industrial robots in the world. That's not a lot. Okay. Um, famously, in 2012, Terry Gow, the chairman of Foxconn, said, I am going to put one million robots into the factories by 2014. And the press picked this up and went, oh my goodness, jobs lost everywhere. And if you were involved in robotics, you meant, where is he going to get one million robots from? Who's going to build them? Uh, he backpedaled on that. But it's slow getting these sophisticated systems out in the world. But the price of robots, sophisticated robot systems, is dropping so incredibly quickly at the moment, while the capabilities are improving, courtesy of our smartphones and our automobiles, among other things. So we've seen the rise of the consumer drone, which was military industrial technology 20 years ago, and then enterprise level technology 10 years ago, and now it's $300 at Costco, or $40 if you want a little 
radio in the world. But the most widely spread robot in the world today is the consumer that robot vacuum cleaner. My robot alone has sold, I think they're up to 12 million now. And it's one of a half dozen robot vacuum cleaner companies now. In fact, the robot vacuum cleaner category for consumer electronics is up to 20 plus percent of all vacuum cleaner sales. And so every major consumer electronics manufacturer now has a robot vacuum cleaner, more or less, because you have to, to compete. So technically that is considered the most widely di distributed robot in the world today, but I think that your car is. Most modern cars don't operate in even partially autonomous mode, well they're starting to now, but under the hood their systems are robotics technologies, and they're capable of a fairly sophisticated amount of hidden autonomy. I have this on good authority from the Vehicle Automation Innovation Lab here at Stanford, so I trust my sources there. However, we talked about robot smog. When you have 12 million robots out there in the world, interesting things start to happen when you release them into the wild. <laughs> And that's just one robot in one house. I'm fascinated by what happens when it's many robots together. And that leads us into trying to predict what happens when many robots work together. So Ducky Town's a project at MIT, 50 small machine autonomous <coughs> systems, because you need to collect many systems together to get the data. However, there is an easier way of collecting that data. It's recorded from the cars that are already out there. Now, while this is, I believe, from one of the Google self-driving cars, I was at a conference recently listening to some presentations where Tesla announced that in the space of nine hours, their company collected as much data as Google had collected in their entire self-driving vehicle program, simply because they have that many Teslas out on the road collecting the data now. So Tesla's made a very interesting foray into this field, and data is everything. And that's where one drone looks like a heck of a lot of fun. But I don't want to be filming my kids' soccer game if there are six other crazy parents with their drones above the game as well. It's like one one drone filming your bike ride or your ski trip. Great. What happens when there's not? And what happens when they don't even speak the same language? What happens when they're all different systems, not just the one Amazon drone delivery? And think about what that's going to be like. Is drone delivery in the air really the best way of doing it? Economically speaking, probably not. But think about the amenity in our lives when that up to 400 foot air space above our houses is full of giant mosquitoes. <laughs> and here's another aspect, robot spam. We're starting to see this. Advertising, communications that we don't want, that provide us with very little value from people that we don't know. Now, the reality is, unfortunately, I believe that robotics is largely driven through commercial interests, and we know what happens. Then you have to make a business model for something. And I believe that we will see a lot of robots that are starting, that will be able to take the advertising off our mobile phones and off our television screens and off our computers and extend it into our lives. At the very least, we will have the annoying level of interact, small, trivial interactions that aren't quite what we need or want. Okay? Because robots are stupid. Just harking back to this, though, we believe that television might be the fault of all evil when it started in the early 1900s. We thought that it was mind control. Okay, George Orwell, 1984. It didn't really turn out to be as bad as that. 1984 wasn't such a bad year. Marshall McLuhan, who said, I never predict anything that hasn't already happened, 
nonetheless predicted a lot of the internet that would come to pass. But he foresaw the interlinking through communication networks well beyond the power of television as a broadcast media. He saw that that interlocking of communication networks would turn television into simply being an entertaining content delivered on these networks. And these networks would start to allow immediate individual interaction social networks. It would allow automatic access to all the world's information and take away established filing systems, Google. It would allow us to commodify or commercialize transactions, Amazon, eBay. And it would allow us to convert our individual lives into commodity transactions. That's where it does start to get a little bit scary. Uh, I do have great respect for what we talked about. As we see the rise of the messenger page, so we've moved from broadcast media to social media to, in, to messaging, and the next step is artificial personalities. And at the moment they are very stupid, but the more of them there are out in the world, and the more data and the more transactions that are compiled, the more effective some of them will be in particularly ugly and narrow use cases. And you're starting to see this happen with Alexa, with Google Home that's just been announced, Xperia have announced a Home Assistant. I think Samsung are working on a Home Assistant, Apple is rumored to be working on a Home Assistant. And in the last two years, more or less, there's been an explosion of social robot assistants coming on the market. Like 10 years ago, it was the robot pets. It was the Avos and the Paros and a whole raft of those. This is the decade where it's the pseudo-humanoid personal assistant. Okay, and I think this is going to be vastly disappointing. So, but don't judge all robots by these ones. Humanoids is not where robotics is going to be good for quite a long time to come. And we shouldn't really expect it. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly through this. We're about to get very disappointed by these social humanoid robots. And it's a remarkably similar graph to the uncanny value, if you're familiar with this concept. The closer something gets to humanoid likeness, the more we like it, until it reaches a certain point when we really, really don't like it. And you see this in the work of um, Hiroshi Ishikuma from Japan, who's made it his specialty to try and push the copying the humans as much as possible. And yet, it's not successful. Some of the reasons behind the uncanny valley is the, the cognitive dissonance that you see in the street test. If you're familiar with this, you can read these letters, but you cannot read the colors. Your mental speed at doing that task is about three times slower than reading the letters. What I find interesting about this is I believe it's a learned response. And I think that we're entering a stage where we will respond to robots as a new ontological category, where they are neither alive nor not alive, where they have some characteristics of liveliness and we react to them that way, but we also understand that they are not full agents with consciousness and intent. And I believe it's really important that we design our robots downwards so that we do not try to fool people in that they have more sophisticated response than they actually do. Because we're very easily fooled. Any magician will tell you how simple it is to fool people. And I strongly believe that badly designed robots take advantage of this and they create false intimacies with us. Okay? We don't like those humanoid robots anyway. They always turn out bad and want to kill us and so forth. However, just leaving here, we're probably all familiar with this concept of the Turing test. If you can't actually tell the difference, does it matter? 
I think this is fascinating. We know we're women in India. It's why we keep talking. When, when we're strong, AI happen. We're struggling with weak AI. I don't know if you're strong AI. is a very, very long way off. Um, ditto this. But in very short interactions, we can be fooled like crazy. Um, look up the Dark Robotics Challenge. I don't have time to talk about it. But humanoid is not always best. Don't be like R2D2 better than C3PO. Mm -hmm. So I like that slide. Mm -hmm. But put two dots on a cookie and we see a face. Mm -hmm. If you find, I won't play the video, but there is a famous experiment from the 40s which shows a triangle, two circles, and a box, and they move around. There is no sound, there is no dialogue, there is no text. The movement of simple geometric shapes tells a story to us. And every person who sees that movie walks out and they know the story that happened. That's how easily we are fooled by very, very simple things. And that's one of the hallmarks of good robot design is that you telegraph, you are transparent. You explain what your system is and isn't, what it can do and what it can't. These are some local robot startups that are doing good design. And once we've got good designed robots, you know, we're going to robots, they will just be appliances. I'm sorry, we are not ready for humans yet. And if we get bad robots, we only have ourselves to blame. We need to design good robots. Thank you.